We're looking at the 15th of 18 videos on Israel's divided kingdom period, getting close to finishing the kings of the southern kingdom of Israel. Although it was way back in the third video, I hope you remember who the first king of the northern kingdom was. Do you remember? Jeroboam. Jeroboam built those golden calves in Dan and Bethel that led his people into a compromised form of Yahweh worship. In this video, we look at the king who's the bookend in Jeroboam's story, King Josiah of the Southern Kingdom. Within three years of the division of Israel, Jeroboam intentionally led his people into an easy, convenient, safe, and ultimately useless religion that essentially worshipped Yahweh in name only. Then one day Jeroboam was worshipping in Bethel when a stranger rode into town. <laughs> a prophet with no name. O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name. And he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you and human bones shall be burned on you. This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. Well, by now we should firmly understand at least one thing about God's judgment. <laughs> God doesn't always execute judgment immediately, but God always judges sin. He's the righteous judge of all the earth. Seven righteous descendants have sat on the throne of David, but the prophecy spoken by the prophet with no name remains unfulfilled until now. Three hundred years after Jeroboam's altar split apart, and 80 years after Jeroboam's kingdom crumbled into ashes, the eighth and final righteous king administered God's promised judgment. His name? <laughs> exactly what the prophet said it would be. Josiah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father and he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David his father. Well, his name means healed by Jehovah or Jehovah will support. He became king when he was eight years old. So let's see, eight years plus Eight more makes him 16 years old, barely old enough to drive when he began earnestly seeking the Lord. Josiah reigned 31 years and stands foremost among all the kings of Judah for his unwavering loyalty to Yahweh. Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses nor did any like him arise after him. He distinguished himself by repairing the temple, implementing a spiritual revival, and beginning a war of extermination against idolatry, which was essentially Judah's state religion for the past 70 years. At the age of 18, he launched sweeping religious reforms, probably the most well-documented reforms in the entire Bible. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes 
with all his heart and all his soul, to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, and the priests of the second order, and the keepers of the threshold, to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the host of heaven. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron, and carried their ashes to Bethel. And he deposed the priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to make offerings in the high places, at the cities of Judah and around Jerusalem. Those also who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and the moon and the constellations, and all the host of the heavens. Moreover, Josiah put away the mediums and the necromancers, and the household gods and the idols, and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem. And in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim, and the carved and the metal images. When he was twenty years old he began purging Judah of idolatry. He eliminated the evil practices that had been instituted by kings Manasseh and Ammon. He deposed and probably executed the priests of Baal. He outlawed magic and sorcery. He destroyed the altars and high places, and pagan images were hacked to pieces. He scattered the broken pieces over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them, and he burned the bones of the priests on their own altars. He actively promoted a centralized worship of Yahweh in Jerusalem. In effect, Josiah tried to change the course of his nation's history by implementing the principles of the Mosaic and Palestinian covenants. And in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, and as far as Naphtali, in their ruins all around, he broke down the altars and beat the Asherim and the images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel. Assyria was having their own problems about this time. They were focused on internal struggles and were not really administering their conquered territories as they should have been. Josiah took advantage of this. He achieved considerable control not only of the southern kingdom of Judah, but also those lands formerly controlled by the northern kingdom. This map shows the extent of his control, and you can see, despite the Assyrians, the lands of both kingdoms were essentially united again under the control of the legal descendant of King David. It's just too bad it couldn't last. Ahaz, Manasseh, and Ammon had intentionally desecrated the Temple of Yahweh. By the end of Ammon's reign, it had long since become a place of Baal worship. Temple prostitutes were housed there. People were sacrificing their children just outside the city gates and prostrating themselves before Asherah on every high hill. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no one might burn his son or his daughter as an offering to Molech. And he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, which was in the precincts. And he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. And the altars on the roof of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars that Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, he pulled down and broke in pieces and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. And the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem, to the south of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon the king of Israel had built for Ashtoreth the abomination of the Sidonians, and for Chemosh the abomination of Moab, and for Milcom the abomination of the Ammonites. And he broke in pieces the pillars, and cut down the Asherim, and filled their places with the bones of men, Moreover, the altar at Bethel, the high place erected by Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, that altar with the high place he pulled down and burned, reducing it to dust. He also burned the Asherah. And as Josiah turned, 
he saw the tombs there on the mount. And he sent and took the bones out of the tombs, and burned them on the altar, and defiled it, according to the word of the Lord that the man of God proclaimed, who had predicted these things. And Josiah removed all the shrines also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which kings of Israel had made, provoking the Lord to anger. He did to them according to all that he had done at Bethel. And he sacrificed all the priests of the high places who were there on the altars, and burned human bones on them. No previous king dared touch anything the great King Solomon ever did. But Josiah desecrated those high places east of Jerusalem, built for Solomon's many foreign wives. He smashed the sacred stones, he burned the wood, and covered the sites with human bones. He desecrated worship sites throughout Judah and Israel, and when he got to Bethel, he fulfilled the prophecy of that prophet with no name. When he was 26 years old, he began restoring and beautifying the temple. During the temple renovation, the high priest discovered what was probably a copy of the Law of Moses. Now, it was very common for people to bury books in buildings under construction, and there's even some evidence one Assyrian king wanted to tear down a temple someplace else just to see if he could find any ancient books hidden inside. Well, this book was not just laying around somewhere. They probably had to knock out a wall to find it hidden inside. When they read the book, Josiah became alarmed and tore his robes. What do you think he was so upset? Well, he knew that Judah had disobeyed God and was going to bear the consequences. Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the secretary, and Isaiah the king's servant, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam, and Akbor, and Shaphan, and Isaiah went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom the son of Tikva, son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they talked with her, and she said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants, all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord? Thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard. Because your heart was penitent, and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place. And they brought back word to the king. I think Josiah was reading from the book of Deuteronomy. And when he got to the part where God says, if you do this, then I'll do this. But if you do that, I'll have to do something you won't like. He knew the people had betrayed their God, and he knew what the consequences were that awaited them. Ten tribes had already been hauled off, just as Moses had predicted. Josiah was looking around thinking, Judah's going to go any day now. 
Now, what would you do in a place like that? Remember, when the Lord declares disaster on Nineveh, Jonah was tickled pink just to sit and watch it happen. They deserved it, right? Well, when the Lord gave the bad news to Jehoshaphat, he thought, well, at least it won't happen to me. But again, Josiah was different. He wanted to do anything in his power to prevent it, or at least delay the inevitable. Hey, if the Lord would postpone judgment until after Hezekiah died because he repented, what would happen if the entire nation repented? Josiah immediately gathered all the people and led them in a renewal of their covenant with Yahweh. Perhaps, just perhaps, God would extend mercy once again. Slaughter the Passover lamb and consecrate yourselves and prepare for your brothers to do according to the word of the Lord by Moses. Then Josiah contributed to the lay people as Passover offerings for all who were present, lambs and young goats from the flock to the number of 30,000 and 3,000 bulls. These were from the king's possessions and his officials contributed willingly to the people to the priests and to the Levites. Hilkiah, Zechariah, and Jehiel, the chief officers of the house of God, gave to the priests for the Passover offerings 2,600 Passover lambs and 300 bulls. Conaniah also, and Shemaiah and Nathanael his brothers, and Hashabiah and Jeiel and Josabad, the chiefs of the Levites, gave to the Levites for the Passover offerings 5,000 lambs and young goats and 500 bulls. When the service had been prepared for, the priests stood in their place and the Levites in their divisions according to the king's command. And they slaughtered the Passover lamb, and the priests threw the blood that they received from them while the Levites flayed the sacrifices. And they set aside the burnt offerings that they might distribute them according to the groupings of the fathers' houses of the lay people to offer to the Lord as it is written in the book of Moses. And so they did with the bulls. And they roasted the Passover lamb with fire, according to the rule. And they boiled the holy offerings in pots, in cauldrons, and in pans, and carried them quickly to all the lay people. And afterward, they prepared for themselves and for the priests, because the priests, the sons of Aaron, were offering the burnt offerings and the fat parts until night. So the Levites prepared for themselves and for the priests, the sons of Aaron. The singers, the sons of Asaph, were in their place according to the command of David and Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun the king's seer, and the gatekeepers were at each gate. They did not need to depart from their service, for their brothers the Levites prepared for them. So all the service of the Lord was prepared that day to keep the Passover and to offer burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord, according to the command of King Josiah. And the people of Israel who were present kept the Passover at that time, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days. No Passover like it had been kept in Israel since the days of Samuel the prophet. None of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover as was kept by Josiah and the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel who were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. No such Passover had been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel or during all the days of the kings of Israel or of the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, In the 18th year of Josiah's reign, the Passover was celebrated with unusual magnificence and jubilation, just as in the days of Hezekiah. Still the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath, by which his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. Nevertheless, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, which burned against Judah. Josiah became king when he was eight. He reigned 31 years. That means he died when he was only 39 years old. All his major reforms occurred in the early years of his reign, and there's really not much detail about what else he did those last 15 years or so in the Bible. We do know he consolidated essentially all the former Northern Kingdom territory under his control without any protest whatsoever from Assyria because, as I said, they were, had their own problems at this time. 
that they had to deal with. They were growing weaker from internal struggles while facing mounting attacks from external enemies who were only growing stronger. To make matters worse, King Ashurbanipal died in 627 BC and civil war broke out. The new Assyrian ruler, Sinsharishkan, was so seriously weakened by this turmoil that the Babylonians and Medes gained their independence in 626 BC without firing a shot. Eight years later, the Babylonians were pressing hard into Assyrian territory. Now, Egypt was still a vassal state of Assyria at this time. And the pharaoh, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, feared this new Babylonian coalition even more than his now greatly weakened master and nemesis. <laughs> he actually sent Egyptian troops to help defend Assyria from the Babylonians. Unfortunately, two has-been nations were no match for an up-and-coming world-class superpower. The ancient Assyrian capital of Asher fell in 614 BC. In 612, only two years later, Nineveh fell and Sinsharishkin was killed. What remained of Assyrian and Egyptian forces fled westward to Haran, but another two years later, the Babylonians captured it too. They drove the survivors even further west across the Euphrates River. Well, just about the time the last remnants were crossing that uh, Euphrates River, Pharaoh Necho came to power in 610 BC. Now he's really worried because what's left of the defenders, what's left of his troops that were sent, are heading his way with the massive Babylonian army right behind him. Pharaoh decides to commit even more troops. Nico's army was way down in the southwest, and they needed to get up to the northeast. And in order to do that, Nico marched along the coastal north south corridor known as the Via Maris, the Way of the Sea. He had to pass right under the old Israelite fortress at Megiddo. Now, it's uncertain exactly why Josiah felt so compelled to get involved in this confrontation with Egypt. He didn't have a dog in this fight. He didn't have to do it. Egypt was an aging empire on its way to being decimated by the Babylonians. He could have just looked the other way, waited a little while, and they would have been gone. <laughs> Probably for good. At least they would have been out of his territory, but he didn't. Now, perhaps he had lingering animosity toward the Assyrians for what they did to the northern kingdom. He didn't want the Egyptians to help him out in any way. Or perhaps he felt obligated to help the Babylonians because it was increasingly obvious who was going to be the next world-dominating power. Maybe it was just because he was king and there was some foreign army marching across his lawn. Regardless of the reason, he engaged them in Jezreel. Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates. And Josiah went out to meet him, but he sent envoys to him, saying, What have we to do with each other, king of Judah? I am not coming against you this day, but against the house with which I am at war. And God has commanded me to hurry. See supposing God, who is with me, lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah did not turn away from him. Josiah did not turn away from him, but disguised himself in order to fight with him. He did not listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God, but came to fight in the plain of Megiddo. And the archers shot King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am badly wounded. So his servants took him out of the chariot 
and carried him in his second chariot, and brought him to Jerusalem. And he died and was buried in the tombs of his fathers. Judah was soundly defeated. Josiah was killed, and although he went into the battlefield disguised, he was still fatally wounded by a random arrow. Can you remember any other king who went to war disguised, <laughs> but still got killed by a lucky shot? Ahab. There's no such thing as luck. Proverbs 16.33 says, Man rolls the dice, but the Lord determines the outcome. Jos Josiah's body was buried with highest honors, and Jeremiah even composed a funeral eulogy. The outburst of national grief was such that Zechariah later compared the grief of seeing the pierced Messiah in the last days to the heartbreak of Josiah's death on the plain of Megiddo. And on that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him, as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him, as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the morning in Jerusalem will be as great as the morning for Hadad Rimen in the plain of Megiddo. Josiah's death had several consequences for Judah, none of them very good. The immediate result was the undermining of all of Josiah's religious reforms. The Palestinian covenant had said that obedience to God would bring blessings and long life. Yet probably the best king to reign since David, the king who had faithfully obeyed God in eliminating idolatry, restoring proper worship in Judah was tragically struck down at a relatively young age, 39. Many may have questioned the validity of the Palestinian covenant or the viability of Yahweh worship altogether. In any case, Josiah's reforms lost steam after his death and the nation returned to idolatry. The long-term effect was that the kingdom of Judah again came under control of Egypt. With Assyria out of the picture, waning Egypt was the only power left to seriously oppose the rising Babylonian Empire. And once again, Judah is caught between two warring giants, and it looks like Judah is standing on the wrong side of the coming fight. In our next video, we'll be looking at the last four kings of the southern kingdom. You can read about these guys in 2 Chronicles 36, 2 Kings 23 and 24, and uh, Matthew's genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. Okay? Have a good day.